thank you everyone for joining. This is our first uh, webinar in our series from the new Bioream uh, network, EPSRC Network Plus. Uh, we're going to be hosting these every uh, three months, every every quarter. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming along today for the first one. So our, our speaker today is um, Dr. Jessica Oaks. Uh, she's joining us uh, from Northeastern University uh, in the US, where it's I think 9 a.m. there in the moment. Um, uh, she uh, graduated uh, in 2008 from Rochester University uh, with an MS in me Mechanical Engineering and then did a PhD at, at UCSD, uh, yeah, University of Canada, uh, California, San Diego uh, in 2013. And that was um, about uh, aerosol deposition in, in, the, in the rat lung or modeling that and imaging that uh, and uh, using modeling to explain uh, some of the imaging there. Uh, and then from 2013 up to 2016, um, she was uh, moved, I think moved around a little bit, but went to France, mainly working at in INRIA, uh, uh, continuing work on modeling aerosol deposition uh, in the lungs. And then in 2016, uh, she joined Northeastern, where she is now uh, as assistant professor. And since then has been awarded grants in uh, health consequences uh, around firefighters in, in, inhaling uh, wild, wildfire smoke. Uh, a couple of grants on that, but I, I'm pretty sure that's not the talk today. The main, the main focus of the talk today is the, uh, is the other, other grant I think she has, which is coupling MRI with modeling to assess treatment feasibility in, in asthma. So the, the, uh, the title of this talk is Aerosols in the Lung, Lessons Learned from Linking Imaging Data with Computational Models. So, uh, I'll hand over to Jessica now, and uh, and if you want, if you want, people want to make sorry, if people want to have any questions, then feel free to to drop them in the um, chat, and I'll sort of pass them on, uh, or at the, we'll have a Q and A at the end, and we can we can ask them face to face then. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you for the um, for the kind introduction. I'm I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, as Carl had mentioned, I um, also have prong, one prong in my lab is doing experimental data on another prong in my lab is doing um, computational models. And today I'm gonna to primarily speak about the computational models as this is the primary interest of this group. So Northeastern is located um, in downtown Boston. And so if you're ever in the Boston area, please, um, contact me and I would be happy to show you our labs and um, our facilities. So as this crowd likely already knows, um, aerosol therapeutics can be used for drug delivery and this has definitely come more to the forefront due to the ongoing pandemic. Aerosols are a great way to deliver drugs primarily because you can target the sites that are in need um, while reducing systemic side effects. Drugs could be treated, used to treat pulmonary diseases, primarily asthma, cystic fibrosis, but also can be used to treat whole body diseases or be developed for vaccination delivery, for example. So the particle fate in the lung is dependent on many factors, but the most primary or the leading order factor is size. So depending on its size, it can deposit in the extra thoracic airways or the upper airways, um, the conducting airways or the deep lung. So very um, small particles are the ones that can deposit in the deep lung on the nano size. And those are usually your smoke and engine exhaust particles. While larger particles can deposit in the central airways. And this is um, between one and five micron particles. The particles that don't deposit can be exhaled back into the environment. So when we're engineering delivery and particle size, we typically want the particles to stay in the lung, not to be exhaled. And so um, we can leverage breathing patterns or particle physics to do that. So there are many key challenges in, in silico medicine or using modeling to predict medical outcomes. And I first wanted, before I go deep into the research part, is to touch on these challenges. The first challenge is, is the need to link data with predictive models. So models can only be predictive if they're validated as, as um, 
as pointed out here, um, as well as if they're love, uh, based off data that's collected, hopefully in vivo. Another challenge with in silico medicine is making appropriate assumptions. All models have assumptions. And so determining which assumptions are appropriate is really important. Today, I will talk a bit about uncertainty quantification um, and statistical analysis. But one of the main challenges of um, these types of models is they're based off a specific patient or ideal patient data set. Um, and so trying to understand statistically what's going on is always a challenge. The application is really important. So if we wanna look at the detailed physics, we have to understand that these models are slow and can take a lot of time to develop as well as to run, but they can tell us a lot about the underlying physics um, that can be used then to maybe develop more fast but less detailed models. And these fast models are maybe lower dimensional models, but they will have more of an application in the clinical sense. As we move forward, we need to couple the mechanics of biological effects. Um, I don't talk too much about that today, but some of the work um, we do in my lab is using the models to design our experiments to look at inflammatory response and remodeling. And finally, we like to link processes across multiple scales, not only space scales, but time scales. Um, I think one of the areas of research that needs to be done is remodeling um, or looking at how so a snapshot in time will evolve over time um, for um, a lifespan, for example. So in general, we use this um, framework that I'm showing here. And today I will deviate in some cases from this framework, but this is a general overall idea of our framework. So we build computational models or 3D geometric models, usually from CT images. And the CT images are chosen here because um, they have high enough resolution that we can build nice models from them. Then we perform airflow simulations and then um, particles throughout inspiration. And so the particles are typically one-way coupling. So the flow field um, impacts the particles, but not vice versa. So it's almost like a post-processing step. Then we go, um, once the particles leave this domain, so this is um, what we call our 3D models. And this only um, includes about maybe three to 5% of the total lung volume. So the particles, once they leave the domain, we pass them on to a 1D model to simulate the distal regions of the lung. And this was based off um, of the original trumpet model that was developed in the 70s. And then during exhalation, we pass the particles back to the 3D model. So that way the particles that do not deposit have the opportunity to be exhaled. And then we do a, a bunch of post-processing steps to look at regional deposition. So this is our general pipeline. And as I mentioned, we do deviate from this pipeline depending on the application. And I will um, highlight that when that's the case. So we build our models, as I mentioned, from CT or MRI data. This, in this example, this is from my PhD work, which seems forever ago now, but this was based off of MRI data. But typically when we're working with patients, we're using CT data for this case. We follow this general pipeline where we draw center lines, outline cross sections, and then lock them to create the 3D geometries in general. But we also can use region growing methods, and that's really dependent on um, the type of images that we get. For our asthma work, we are doing 3D region growing, and, and that helps us to capture some of the more remodeled airways. It's also faster to do, especially when we're looking at a big patient population. So going right into how we're solving the fluid, in the 3D geometry, we're solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, as you notice, most of our models do not have the upper airways, and that's usually a limitation due to the imaging resolution. We are working with some upper airway models or incorporating some upper airway models um, into our framework, but in general, we're interested in what's happening more downstream. 
and the turbulent eddies and um, turbulent um, physics is typically um, resolved by the first or second generation. So we're not including that here. What's somewhat unique about these models is the incorporation of the boundary condition. So experimentally, we can measure or know when a patient is breathing um, at their mouth, but it's not typically possible to know what the pressure and velocity is at these distal airways. So that's when we incorporate these 0D models. These 0D models are based off our resistance and compliance. Um, for some of this work where we determine the global resistance and compliance based off experimental data, and some of this work we're using um, data that's available in the literature. And so how this works is this is um, implicitly coupled in the solver where in general, we're solving for the 3D Navier-Stokes in the, in the green regions, and the flow rate is passed to the 0D model. We saw the 0D model, and then the pressure is applied as a Neumann-type boundary condition back to the 3D model. Once we solve for the flow, then we look at the particles, as I had mentioned in our pipeline. So in the 3D domain, we um, solve a reduced form of the Maxi Riley equation. And so this Maxi Riley equation includes um, buoyancy. It also includes drag. We do some um, work with diffusion, but for this talk, it's particles that are greater or drug particles, so they're not really diffusing. We ignore particle particle interaction. We also assume that the particles do not grow once they're inhaled. Um, which seems to be okay assumptions for this work. Once we solve for the particles in the 3D, then we pass them to the 1D, where we're solving basically an advection diffusion equation with the loss term due to deposition. So this is just looking at the concentration of particles once they leave the 3D domain and are passed to the 1D domain. The loss term is based off of empirical relationships determined in the literature um, for deposition due to sedimentation and um, inertia impaction. So the first part of this talk, um, the first few minutes of this talk, I'm gonna um, show some of our work from my postdoc um, and uh, my PhD work where we're looking at rats and then we're applying it to humans. And the reason is, is that we're able to validate the simulation framework in the rats um, before we can apply it to the humans. And so the 1D geometry is lobe specific. So each lobe is parameterized based off its geometry. Specifically, what's really important is the diameters, where the acinar region starts, and the alveolar size. As you can notice, for example, the apical lobe, which in the rat is the top right lobe, um, starts in a much earlier generation, the acinar region, than, for example, the diaphragmic lobe. And this will have consequences in the deposition. Um, so when we pass the particles between the 3D and 1D domains, the, how we describe the particles changes. So in the 3D domain, we're tracking each individual particle where in the 1D domain, we're looking at a concentration of particles. Um, so this here is showing you the particles um, throughout the 3D domain during inhalation. So we're starting to see the particles and then the concentration of particles becomes uniform. And then during exhalation, we're seeing the particles back um, and until we reach a steady state where the flow rate approaches zero. So this is going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of how this works. So particles are being seeded at the inlet, they're being passed through the 3D domain, and then they're um, being delivered to each of the lobes. So each of these uh, images is a lobe, so the left lobe, cardiac, apical of the, of the rat lung. So this is for inspiration. And then expiration, the opposite happens where the particles are seeded back into the 3D domain um, based off of what is solved for in the 1D dimension, uh, domain. 
And as I mentioned before, the reason why this is important is so that we can simulate exhalation and know how many particles are lost during exhalation, but also we can simulate lobe specific geometry. And the geometry of each lobe is, is a bit different, um, specifically when the alveolar region is reached. So as I mentioned in the beginning, validation is very important. So this here is a plot of some of our validation work um, back during my postdoc time. So these gray squares are the experimental data collected during my PhD. And this is looking at deposition normalized by volume fraction. I won't go into too much details about how this was collected. Um, you can definitely check out the papers. But basically, we leverage MRI to quantify deposition of the particles in each lobe of the lung of a rat um, lung. And we looked at both healthy and elastase induced model, but here I'm just talking about the healthy data. The purple dots are the dots where we do not incorporate the 1D model. So we're only looking at the 3D models. Um, so we're ignoring what's happening distally as well as what's being exhaled. And it was, I think, statistically good agreement for maybe not for the apical lobe. However, when we incorporated a 3D, 1D simulation, so taking into account what's happening distally, we do see a better agreement between the experimental data and the, and the simulations, specifically for this apical lobe. And the reason why I keep bringing this lobe up is in the toxicology field, this lobe is considered the dirty lobe. It's the lobe that gets most of the particles. So if I was interested in what happens um, to particles once they're inhaled and the biological effects, I may primarily look at the apical lobe because it's known to get a greater amount of the inhaled particles. And so because we're incorporating that low specific geometry, we're better able to match the experimental data for this lobe. And specifically, deposition is enhanced once you reach the acinar region. And because the path length between the mouth and the acinar region is smaller or shorter in the apical lobe, um, we're better able to match um, the experimental data. So now that we have a bit more confident in our models, we wanted to look at asthma. Um, asthma is a complex and heterogeneous airway disorder. Most people know um, what asthma is. Asthma can have several different phenotypes and endotypes. Specifically, we could have airway remodeling, um, excessive mucus production, In this work, we're particularly interested in severe asthmatics. Um, severe asthmatics tend to be refractory to um, inhaled drugs, so they don't respond very well to their um, inhaler medication. Um, so they're not meeting the treatment strategies um, that are primarily to reduce the risk of exacerbations and the need for hospitalization. So here are some images that I pulled from this paper of um, asthma um, subjects, and they're going um, up in severity level. And this is hyperpolarized gas images, uh, where the left one here is a more mild moderate, and the one on the far, um, I think right for everyone, is the severe asthma subject. And the green here is telling you how much of the gas is delivered to each region of the lung. And as you can see, as we're going up in severity level, we have these areas of black where there's parts of the lung that are not being used for ventilation. Subjects with mucus plugs um, tend to be a big challenge in asthma um, research. These are um, regions of the lungs that can be completely blocked off. And, and maybe this is what's happening here where you're having these dark regions completely blocked off due to a mucus plug. So this here plot is showing um, FEV1, which is a spirometry measure. It's about a volume that a patient can exhale um, in one second based off their, so this is showing you based off of their number of mucus plugs. So before bronchodilator and then post bronchodilator, 
the subjects with very few mucus plugs tend to um, recover their lung function. But subjects, oops, with, um, with mucus plugs do not recover their lung function. So they're not responding well to the bronchodilator. And this is probably because the particles aren't getting to the regions of the lung that have is causing the lung dysfunction because the flow is not going there. So as I mentioned, about 15% of adult asthmatics do not respond well to inhaled therapy. So um, when I first started this work back in right at the beginning of my um, professorship, I thought it was really interesting because I thought, well, if I didn't work, if I worked in the silo and I didn't work with anyone, maybe I can understand a little bit about asthma pathology and disease progression. But if I worked with clinicians and MR physicists, then we can really have an impact. So that's the idea behind this work is bringing together people that work with actual patients, with modelers, so that we can identify characteristic phenotypes and that lead to inadequate therapeutic delivery. Maybe we can start to understand who will respond to certain therapeutics. Maybe if they're being um, switched over to biological therapy, do, is that some of the need to be um, for their life or can they be switched back to inhaled therapy? So these are the types of questions that we're really interested in understanding. So I work with um, Professor Sean Fain. He was at Madison when we first started this work and now is at the University of Iowa and he's an MR physicist. And so he works with all types of patients, but in this work um, primarily focused on asthma subjects. So the type of data that his lab collects is both CT and MRI. CT data is really to get the anatomy. And the MRI is telling you um, what parts of the lung are not receiving inhaled gas. So the CT data we use to get the anatomy. And from the anatomy, we can break up the lung into these 19 regions based off the feeding segmental branch. And then with the MRI, we can get how much of the gas is being delivered to the lung. So this is a steady state um, imaging technique. So we know um, at a point in time, how much of the inhaled hyperpolarized gas is going to the regions of the lung and how much of the lung is not getting the gas. We don't really know too much about the dynamics of inhalation or the ventilation perfusion. So that's a caveat of this research. With this hyperpolarized gas images, we can get regions where we don't have any gas going, and we can link those back to these 19 regions of the lung. So these 19 segmental regions, we are linking back to the airway anatomy, and we're looking at this SVDP measure, which is basically telling us what percent of the lung is not getting inhaled gas. So we use this information to parameterize our models. So before I begin with the details of that, I first wanted to acknowledge my PhD student, Carmen, who um, spearheaded the majority of the work in this talk. So what we're interested in is using this segmental data to parameterize our 3D model and in a way kind of understanding how the delivered gas can be used to parameterize our boundary conditions. So here we're using a resistance boundary condition. And we first start off with a resistance of a normal healthy lung. And then we iterate on these resistances until we're matching the volume delivered to the lungs with our model with the experimental um, SVDP data. So we, get, we perform up to 10 iterations. If there's a mucus plug, we are unable to, we have challenges of resolving our resistances because the resistance would have to go basically to infinity in order to have the obstruction. But this tends to work more in, in subjects that have, don't have mucus plugs. So we have both a diseased and a normal airway, and this is because 
um, otherwise the gas won't be conserved. So in general, the disease airway is the one that's um, constricted or the resistance is increased and this allows a gas redistribution. Once we finish with this, we look at the 3D resistances, we look at the total resistance of the lung, and we also look at the deposition. First thing we looked at is how this change in resistance um, correlates with the SVDP. Um, again, this is an MRI measure. And so oops, we see that the resistance by design, I would say, increases with their SVDP and um, increases at about a 2.6 times rate um, compared to SVDP. So the first cohort we looked at was for six subjects, two healthy, two mild, moderate, and two severe. So the healthy subjects um, had the relatively similar 3D resistance as well as SVDPs and 0.02 and one is basically a normal, um, no ventilation defects. Then we look at our um, four asthmatic subjects, sorry, specifically looking at these two severe subjects. So the severe subjects have similar SVDPs, but their 3D resistance was an order of magnitude different. Um, and so this was very curious to us because we were initially I naively came into this thinking, oh, they're both severe subjects, we're gonna have a similar result, but actually they're quite different. And that's coming down to where their airways are remodeling. Severe asthma subject three seem to have more distal remodeling. So we weren't capturing that in our 3D model where the severe asthma subject four had more central airway remodeling, which is reflected in the 3D resistance increase. Looking at the deposition, so um, primarily looking at these two subjects, this two severe subjects, because of the airway remodeling, central airway remodeling, this subject AS4 had much higher deposition in their airways um, compared to the subject three. So going back and looking at the cohort data, we realized that subjects could um, be severe and be otherwise quite the same, same age, same sex, same FEV1, but their SVDPs or VDPs, depending on if you're looking at the segmental level or the whole lung level, could be quite different. And so we were thinking that our models could help interpret some of this data. So as I had mentioned, we're looking at this SVDP we decided to go a little further into what we're looking at and looking at um, high ventilation regions, medium ventilation regions, low ventilation regions, and defected regions. And basically it's a level of how much the lung is being defected. High ventilation regions, I kind of imagine it being the regions of the lung that are getting the inhaled gas because other regions of the lung are not. So due to um, a mass conservation. So we looked at a cohort of about 26 subjects. Um, this was a big undertaking because as I had mentioned, we create the 3D models from CT data and creating those models right now cannot be done automatically. It takes a lot of, um, a lot of work to create those models. So 26 subjects was a good number for us. The FEV1 was um, lower in our severe subjects, but not statistically. Um, we also looked at if they've had a past exacerbation and whether or not they've had to go to the hospital due to a breathing problem. Before I go into the modeling, I wanted to give you a basis of where these subjects stand from the imaging viewpoint. So as I mentioned, this VDR is the defected region and low ventilation region is not quite defective, but has less delivered gas than what um, is supposed to go there. So looking at this data, our severe subjects definitely had larger regions of these two um, defected and low ventilated regions. They also had less 
moderately ventilated region. So this would be where your normal lung would stay. And then has slightly less, but not really that different of high ventilated regions. Looking at their FEV1, I already preluded to this before, but there really wasn't much of a difference in the FEV1 between the mild, moderate, and severe, as well as the FVC. So we weren't able to distinguish um, the lungs using this global spirometry metric. So then we did the simulations and we looked at the central deposition, with, or sorry, central resistance and found that central resistance actually was higher in the severe subjects, ab ab albeit the wide variability in um, resistances. We also found a higher total resistance. So the total resistance takes into account the iterations on the resistances um, to get the desired flow split. So the central airway resistance is a marker, so to speak, of central airway remodeling, where the distal resistance indicates more distal airway remodeling. Then we looked at the deposition and also found that the severe subjects in general had higher deposition compared to the mild moderate subjects. Um, and this is deposition in the central airways. And this is due to um, airway remodeling. For example, this airway here is almost um, fully occluded. Either we can't really tell from the MRI images or the images that were given, we're not that much of experts, but um, either due to airway remodeling or mucus plug. So central deposition may be great if you want to target the central airways, but if the asthma is more distally located, it may be bad because you can think of this as a loss of particles due to the deposition in the central airways. It was interesting to see that central deposition also correlated with central resistance. So this makes sense because resistance is related to the diameter to the fourth power. So if the diameter changes even just a little bit, the resistance will increase. And we found that deposition was was correlated to the resistance. Um, interestingly enough, the subjects with mucus scores, you know, tended to have higher deposition compared to the rest of the cohort. We also looked at how FEV1 changed relative to before and post bronchial dilator and found a, a nice correlation um, with on uh, FEV1 change with deposition, except for the caveat of our subjects that have high mucus scores, where even though they will have a large percent of deposition, they won't reverse in their lung function. Their lung function still stays quite stable. As I mentioned before, we looked at hospitalization. So whether or not the subjects had to go to the hospital due to a breathing related event. So the triangles here are the severe subjects and the circles are the mild moderate. So they're kind of um, distributed between this metric. And we found that the patients that had to go to the hospital due to a breathing event had higher distal resistance as well as higher total resistance. And so this was better able to separate the subjects than due to the severity level alone. So now that I've given you some um, results, I thought I would take it a step back and kind of talk to you about sensitivity analysis. So we went down this, um, Karma, my PhD student, um, really spearheaded this, event, this work. And he wanted to understand how sensitive our results were to the modeling inputs and specifically how sensitive it was to the experimental data that were given. So there's lots of sources of uncertainty, the geometry, the flow rates, and the boundary conditions specifically. So we wanted to know how these uncertainties can propagate into the model's output and also looking at how that propagates into the model's output, what is the most sensitive metric? So 
Is the geometry the most sensitive? Is the boundary conditions the most sensitive? So in this work, we leverage lower dimensional models. Um, these lower dimensional models are based off our 3D geometry. So they were parameterized based off the diameters, lengths, and angles, as well as the, how they're connected. And we solved a multiple path um, 1D model for each of these 3D geometries. Before I go into how the sensitivity is to the modeling inputs, I first wanted to convince you that the 1D models well represented the 3D models. So here we're looking at lobe order delivery, and this is for the left upper lobe. The 1D MRI is a 1D model using the MRI boundary conditions, where the 1D is using the boundary conditions from the 3D model. And so the delivery to each lobe as well as delivery of each segment, and that's what's here in the gray, um, match well between the 1D and 3D models. And this is the upper left lobe, and we also looked at the other um, four lobes. We also looked at central deposition and found that the 1D models well predicted the deposition in the 3D um, models. It was a little less. Um, and this is because the 1D models are using a constant diameter. And, um, and so the, the asthma subject specifically can change an airway diameter along the path of the airway because of remodeling. So it's not surprising that we were a little less in the 1D model compared to the 3D model. So the sensitivity analysis framework leverages this 1D model, and we're looking at variations in our input for specifically the airway diameters, the segmental volumes, and the defective volume fractions. And then we're looking at our outputs, low board delivery, and central deposition. We perform perturbations over multiple ranges um, from 1 to 15%. We assign random values to these perturbations, and we perform um, about 10,000 simulations per perturbation. So we, because it's a 1D model, and because the model can be solved on the order of seconds, we can perform many simulations per perturbation. And because we have so many um, simulations, we can then come up with confidence intervals for statistical analysis. So what we found is that low bar delivery is primarily sensitive to deliver gas volume. So this is the gas volumes that we're getting from the MRI. So this is looking at the right upper lobe delivery and D is diameter. And so not very sensitive to diameter, but it's quite sensitive to this um, segmental volume that we're getting from the MRI and CT data as well as how much of that volume is defected. So each one of these um, symbols is a different percent of variation that we're using in the sensitivity analysis model. We also looked at the combined effects and really there wasn't um, a substantial combination of the effects and it really was dominated by the segmental volume. So if we're looking at low bar delivery, then we must be quite interested in what our segmental volume and our defective volumes are. This here is showing you low bar delivery for 15% range of perturbations. And these are violin plots. So they're kind of showing you the range um, and the statistical um, deviation. With a 15% range in perturbation, we had about a 3 to 6% range in the output. So the output is um, almost half of what the range of perturbation is. This range depended on the lobe volume. So the right middle lobe, for example, the one down here, um, had the less sensitivity because the lobe volume is, is smaller. <clears throat> 
If we then look at um, central deposition, so this is what's happening in our 3D models for different particle sizes, so one micron, three micron, and five micron. For the different variations, we can see that actually for the th deposition in the 3D model is most sensitive to airway diameter and not at all sensitive to the ventilation distributions. Again, we looked at the combined effects. It seemed that this um, deposition variation was largest for the five micron particles, which makes sense. The five micron particles are more likely to deposit due to inertia and inertia comes about because you have changes in the geometry, the flow field follows the geometry, the particles do not, and so they deposit. Looking at how this variation in diameter relates to the central deposition as we increase our variation in how we're changing our diameters and the central deposition increases. Also, the more heterogeneity we have in our model, the larger the, the, um, the particle deposition is is very minimal, but it's starting, it's interesting and something maybe to think about further is the more heterogeneity that you have, the more deposition you have. So um, as I finalize this talk, I wanted to give you some final conclusions. Um, what we found was that air, airflow mechanics, specifically resistance in this work, is correlated to severity levels and past hospitalization. And the subjects that needed to go to the hospital tended to have larger um, airway resistances. And this is airway resistance during normal breathing. This is not during um, an asthma attack, for example. Regions of high deposited dose seem to correlate with central airway remodeling. And this is because central airway remodeling reduces the diameter. So if you think about it, the Stokes number will increase because the velocity through those airways increases. So therefore more particles are likely to deposit. The presence of mucus plugs tend to lead to higher airway resistance as well as particle deposition. This may be because of airway remodeling, as well as some heterogeneity in the flow distribution is impacting the deposition. Aerosol delivery is sensitive to inhaled gas volume, while deposition is sensitive to geometry. So if we're interested in deposition in the central airways, it's, it's um, uh, to our advantage to pay attention to the geometry. Well, if we're looking at delivered gas volumes, paying attention to our boundary condition seems to be more important. So future efforts will focus on collateral ventilation. So looking at the gas distribution during the dynamics, as well as more of a response to inhaled medication. So going back to that validation piece, if we can correlate deposited dose to response um, that would be highly um, impactful in my opinion. So those are two things that we're looking at in the future. And that is really what is needed to bring um, these types of models to more of a clinical decision-making um, impact. We have some ongoing work in our lab, um, specifically um, on the right-hand side, we're looking at surfactant delivery in preterm infants. Um, and this is with collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I actually have a postdoc opening um, with that project. So if anyone is interested or know of someone that might be interested, I'm really looking for someone, a postdoc to help lead the simulations for surfactant delivery in preterm infants. This work was obviously not done in a vacuum. Um, it requires work from undergraduates, PhD students, as well as collaborators, specifically Sean Fain, who um, believed in some of the modeling in the beginning and gave us the data that we leveraged for the modeling work. Michael Alshaus, who oops, helped with a lot of the sensitivity analysis and brought in that expertise. And then Kamran here um, was the PhD student that um, this work is 
mostly um, attributed to. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or, and I thank you again for having me here today. Lynn, thank you very much uh, for that talk. It was really good. And I think it um, really showed uh, sort of what you can do if you get the right people together and uh, showed some great examples of the stuff you can achieve with this and modeling techniques we're interested in and also you know getting clinicians and imaging specialists together. So that's fantastic. Uh, we do already have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, well, we have two questions from Josh, actually. And I, I think you've kind of answered his first question slightly later on in one of the slides, but um, uh, I'll ask them together because they're, they're related. So so um, you mentioned about the calculation of the 3D resistance and how you sort of iterate that back to the um, so you have 10 simulation iterations to, to iterate that back to the sort of what you see in the MRI images. Uh, how long uh, or how large is each simulation uh, and how long does it take? And is there any way to calculate this, I guess, more quickly uh, or in a single simulation? Yeah, so depending on the severity of asthma, it takes about 10 iterations, but all that's done automatically. So, you know, we throw it to our cluster and have it go through the script until it run, comes into a solution where we're satisfied. We have talked about doing this quicker. And I think one of the ways to do that is to leverage the zero lower dimensional models. So if we can use lower dimensional models to first iterate on the boundary condition, um, that would be much faster. Getting those 1D dimensional models is sometimes um, a bit of more hands-on type work where if we just throw it to the cluster, it's kind of hands-off. So you know, it kind of depends on and where you want to spend your time. Right, and and just to be clear, but I think you had to answer. So then, when you get your dv by dt, essentially your volume changes in the in the distal part of the lung, that then feeds back to the velocity boundary condition for your CFD. It's a pressure boundary. It's a pressure. Oh, boundary. pressure boundary condition. Yeah. Not velo okay. Yeah, and so. Um, and usually we set either a flow rate boundary condition at the inlet or a zero pressure, depending on um, the simulations that we're doing. Great, uh, and Bindi, you have a question. Thanks, thank you very much for a really fantastic talk. Um, my question, I've got two questions actually. First one is to do with you referring to sort of central and distal remodeling. Um, from what you've said, it sounds like you can't really distinguish between sort of airway remodeling as referred to structural changes versus mucus plugs versus um, sort of bronchoconstricted airways, potentially just through high contractile tone, which we know exists in asthmatics. Am I right in thinking that, that you can't distinguish between those things? Um, or can you tell from the MRI which of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're kind of touching on some of our future work and some of our next ideas. And I think some of the dynamic imaging and modeling is really going to help us distinguish between if it's an airway remodeling versus mucus plug. Because mucus plug, I believe the airways are completely obstructed. And so there's not going to be gas delivered. Where airway remodeling maybe is just fill slower. And so I think some of those dynamic imaging will be really helpful um, in, in distinguishing between airway remodeling and a mucus plug. Right, but then within that, air, within that sort of subdivision, can you tell between something that's like an irreversible thing versus mm -hmm. something that's bron simply bronchoconstricted at the time or just some kind of persistent contractile tone, which could, I suppose the pre and post bronchodilator studies would. Perhaps. Yeah, and maybe doing some longitudinal imaging. Right. Okay. So, and um, this is really something that we're interested in doing. We just need to get those studies going. But if other people are interested in doing it too, yeah, I think longitudinal imaging, as well as maybe looking at pre and post bronchodilator. Most of this work was um, retrospective. So we started to think about what we could do more prospectively. 
first we had to kind of prove that we could do something at all. And now, now we can try to think about what's going to go in the future. Um, my second question was to do with the, your zero D models at the, at the end of your airways. Um, what, so you can, you're, you're inferring these resistances as you described through this iterative process. Can you do the same for compliances or, and at the moment, are you just applying the same compliance all over? Well, ha, sorry, there's probably a few things in there. <laughs> so yeah, so some of Karma's thesis, which I didn't talk about today was actually um, iterating on the compliances too, based off of dynamic images. Um, but that work is still, I would say in this infancy. So I didn't really want to go too deep into that. But um, based off of dynamic and delayed feeling, we can also um, think about the compliance. We just, it's just not ready for um, publication or anything like that. Yeah, it's more still in the elementary stages. Okay, thank you. Great, right. and we, we do have a couple more questions in the chat okay. actually, if you just got a little bit more time. Um, so. Uh, Guillaume uh, asked, um, I said, thank you for a great talk. Um, he said with asthma, I guess, typically being thought of as a small airways disease and where the current li limit of resolution of the CT is, do you think uh, you're able to capture sort of what, what's needed to make the right predictions? Or do you think, you, I guess, miss something in those distal airways? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, part of, we segmented the distal or the 3D models partly due to the MRI data actually, because we only knew the ventilation due to those 19 segments. Um, I think we could have built our CT models out even further, but then we didn't know like what types of boundary conditions to apply. That is one reason. The second reason is we wanted all the models to be pretty similar, so that way we can make some comparisons. From what I understand, the CT data could give us higher resolution. Um, it's just how the imaging data is output from the CT scanner. Um, so I think capturing those airways may be feasible. It's going to be a lot more work because as soon as you go up in generation, you know, you have two to the power to no more number of airways. So I think maybe doing it for a couple models will be worth it. If you wanted to look at a cohort, it's probably going to be more complicated hmm. um, to do. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it soon becomes too big for the for the three D uh, simulations as well, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, and, that, and but maybe doing some lower dimensional models to incorporate that physics is the way to go. Um, but creating a bigger model for a few subjects is probably feasible, but probably not as you get to 30 or so subjects becomes mm -hmm. quite intense. Uh, and a, a very quick question from Josh asking if that sensitivity analysis work is published in any of the papers, uh, any of your papers yet? Not yet. We're working on, we're drafting the manuscript now, so hopefully soon. I'm glad that um, you found it interesting. <laughs> That's great. Um, I did have a few questions. I didn't want to uh, impose too early, but I, I think I've got time for one. So I was wondering, I noticed there was, when you had your two severe asthmatic subjects, they had very different overall resistance, um, you pointed out, because, because one had essentially quite large central airways and the other one had quite constricted central airways. Um, is there an opportunity for the using something like is it plethysmography or some measurement of overall resistance uh, of the lungs to kind of um, inform what your distal airways resistance should be? Yeah, that's a really great question. So when we, um, John and I were thinking about our next project, we want and that, you know, be more prospective. There's ways now that we can capture lung mechanics using like a handheld device. Um, and there's been some companies to develop devices that can be used in the clinical setting where before it was mostly research setting. And so the idea was um, when we started to think about designing 
future studies was to collect that data. And it's gonna be really powerful because it could be used either to parameterize our models, but also maybe think about validation. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely something we're interested in. Unfortunately, we didn't, we don't have that data now. Yeah. Yeah, there's always there's always more data you could do with right. <laughs> yeah, but you have to be level. careful, right? You want to make sure you pick the because if you're working with subjects, you want to make yeah, sure yeah. that like everything is going to be useful. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. So, uh, yeah, just thank Jessica once again with your virtual claps or however you want to do it. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so th thanks everyone for coming along. The I've just put a uh, message in the chat saying you can, uh, if you're not signed up to the network, do do sign up at our website, which is bioream.net. That's B-I-O-R-E-M-E, -E. and um, you can suggest future webinar speakers if you want to um, as well, and keep up to date with the events and the funding calls uh, and things like that. Uh, Jessica, you mentioned you have a, a postdoc opportunity coming up. Let me know the details, and we can share it with the, the network. Yeah, as well. I can put my email in here but I'm doing interviews now so if anyone's really interested or knows someone okay. <laughs> yeah I'm like seriously looking for a postdoc so excellent okay, okay. well thank thank you again and uh, thank you everyone for coming see see you in, a, in about three months for the next one of these hopefully <laughs> <laughs>